and welcome to Connecting a Better World, where we spend time meeting some of the most incredible human beings who make this world a better place. We will learn how each individual took their ideas, mission, and purpose to create and serve others in business and organizations that surround social good, social entrepreneurship, and social impact, and find out how we, together, can further connect others to help. I am your host, Dr. Natalie Phillips. Today, we will be talking with my dear friend, Sherry Matthews, an engineer, a teacher, and a mom who took her experiences, curiosity, and drive and created and invented a product to solve a problem and to serve others. Join me as we listen to her incredible journey and learn from her never-ending wisdom and care for others as she inspires us to learn, ask questions, and take ideas to the next level. I want to start off with introducing my dear friend because she is incredible from the minute i met this woman i am just excited for her to tell her story and so sherry i went through your bio and i know who you are as a friend and i know what you do and we'll get to your social responsibility business but your background blows me away computer engineering (laughs) physical ed teacher. You know, I also want you to talk about the First Tee National program because I had some questions about that. And then founder and CEO of the business that I'd like you to talk about. But not only that, I went on and read about the things that I didn't know, an advisor, an angel investor. I mean, these are things that living in this entrepreneurial world with how I got introduced to you, all of these terms are becoming a little more familiar to me, but they might not be familiar to my listeners. And because your company and who you are is so different from some of the previous guests I've had on the show, I want to first start from the beginning and tell me a little bit more about you went to school to become something and how you got to be where you are. And I know there's not a lot of time, but I want to share that story because I struggled with it as well. And you and I have talked about this. You go to school for a certain degree and you think that's who you're supposed to be and that's what defines you. And I want to hear your story of how you came into walking into the space where you are right now. Well, thank you. And thank you for all your kind and supportive words, Natalie. I love your vision. I'm honored to be here. And I'll try to keep my answers kind of short, concise, so we can handle as many questions as possible. How about that? Great. Well, I went into computer engineering and technology because it was kind of new. This was a time when there was mainframes and it was sort of like how people view maybe solar energy right now. They're like, I don't know if it's going to take off, but it did. I got chosen to work in IBM, had three months of profiling, testing, and I was blessed to actually be the only woman in this innovative group, basically inventor brains that can solve problems pretty rapidly. And I had a wonderful, wonderful experience working for IBM. And that actually set the mindset of a problem solving out in society. And so after IBM, which I had to do a lot of presentations, which freaked me out because I was very young, the only woman in a boardroom of basically professors and MIT heads and very off the chart rocket scientists, and I do mean real rocket scientists, oh my gosh. Uh, and I'm presenting to them findings and solutions and things like that. But I just want your listeners to know that I did it out of comfort zone because I'd actually get sick before presenting because I'd be so nervous because I'm thinking, who am I? Who am I supposed to be telling I these guys you. what they need to do? This is crazy. But I wanted to pop that in there because you may have some younger people listening and they think, oh, it's easy for them. And, oh, they work for IBM. And, oh, and no, nothing's easy. You just have to do it. And I'm going to tell you that after several attempts and working through it, I became like the number one presenter. Wow. And it became very fun for me because I took the pressure off. And somebody said, just pretend you're the weather reporter. And, okay, I can do that because I didn't know how I was supposed to feel and look. Anyways, I just want to throw that in there because everything in life is scary. Starting a new business is scary. But to me, that scary stuff is what makes the world a difference in your journey on this planet. 
So then I went into physical education because I was raising our children and I wanted to be around them. Have, so that was the reason why you school. left computer engineering yeah. and research and development at IBM was because of the That's family. That's correct. Yeah, that was my decision. You know, because I believe teaching is a very noble calling. If I had it differently, I'd be paying them all $500,000 a year <laughs> because they shape our children. Yeah. That is the future. And teachers, honestly, they can make a child's imagination and hope and dreams come true mm -hmm. just by believing in them and educating. So I went into that because I felt it was a noble cause. So you went back and got college. your degree in teaching? I actually tested out, Natalie. I just, I tested out. Oh my. I fast-tracked. I mean, I just, I tested out. And it was a modification program, um, and it was in the first in a private school, and then I went on like that. But during that time, same mindset of problem solving, I saw a lot of things going on in the public school systems and the private school systems. And I was teaching one day with my very best friend, Ben Akale, and we were both instructing children on a striking unit. And she came up to me and said, hey, it was uh, Aaron Stewart, Payne Stewart's son, mm -hmm. is taking golf lessons. And I'm like, whoa, that's awesome. We love them. The whole family's amazing. And this is why Payne was passed. So it was kind of like we were watching them carefully. Anyways, I said, you know what? Why can't all children learn the game of golf? And she said... Well, it's not in their circle. They, you know, may not have the demographics capability of getting off and playing golf, Sherry. And I'm like, I know. But the actual physical learning of the game of golf is a behavior modification program because you have to be very honest. It has inherent aspects of the game where honesty, integrity, and perseverance, and judgment, all those things are built into it. So I'm like... Wouldn't it be great if all children could be at least exposed like soccer, basketball, volleyball? She goes, yeah, come see this weird equipment that some of these people have introduced me to, first touch. Well, a long story short, we started with 48 children. We tried to get into the public school system, had the door slammed in our face. I don't even know how many times. And then we got under the umbrella of the first tee. And we are the first T national school program and instrumental to reaching, are you ready? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Starting with 48 students, reaching 10 million children all over the United States, what? no matter where they live, inside of their public school physical education, they now can learn the inherent values of this particular game that build in honesty, integrity, perseverance, good judgment, and these core values. So we teach nine core values, nine healthy habits, and the game of golf. Wow. And guess what? We are watching and hearing people going to college scholarships now because they learn first touch in PE class. Which is incredible because I thought when you started talking about why can't all kids learn how to play golf, I was not thinking about these other behavioral modifications or whatever you call them, these attributes I was waiting for, because in golf, you kind of have to stay calm and you have to, it's a different type of sport for sure. But I wasn't going, I mean, this is bigger than just teaching kids golf. Yeah. This is actually teaching them nine core values is what you said. Nine core values, nine healthy habits. We address the, the things that are healthy for a child as they're growing up. Sometimes parents aren't even good role models that way. But you're exactly right. The act of the sport of golf is secondary to the life behavior modification and introduction to core values that can take them a life long journey of making wow. good decisions. Wow. And so the club in the hand is the secondary effort. And it's just been amazing because all of the state of Vermont has it in their classes. And they say it spills over into the other classroom behavior so they go down to the oh, PE class sure. what are we learning this month well we're doing honesty okay we'll keep our eyes open for children that are showing and demonstrating honesty so it's like a school-wide program it's been so exciting Natalie it's one of my <sighs> most proud moments is when General Colin Powell got on the stage and presented that he just came back from the White House and the First Lady this is when President Obama and First Lady was in office and said that I just presented the first tee and the national school program looking at Benna and I 
as a top 10 initiatives to change the youth of America. Oh we just want to fall out of our gosh. chair. <laughs> oh, yeah, my mouth is just wide open. I'm like, oh my mm-hmm. gosh. Natalie, this is the thing. Just because the one question, well, why can't golf be for <laughs> all children? Yeah. How long has this program right? been going now? Oh, I think we've been on it for 15 years. Yeah. It's, so it's implemented like in schools all over the United States. And that was Ben and I. We were the co-pioneers of that. It's a real wonderful feeling, actually, to take a wrong, which I believe is wrong, and I think golf needs to be for all children because of the inherent core values, and make it available. And now we're literally living it. Wow. We're watching it. And then watching these kids go up and into college. Wow. Whew. Oh yeah. my gosh. Then that wasn't even why you were here, but I love that story and I love the organization. And I can't believe it went from 48 students to now you're reaching probably way over 10 million. Yeah, that was what we reached. Is And that's, of course, with the chapters also doing all their amazing, good, hard work. I'm going to tell you the first T is probably one of the most influential programs because we have children like here in Austin and they're on the streets. You know, and we bring them in, they do their homework, they get pizza, and they learn from a professional golf instructor. Wow. Is it an after-school Not program? Only... Yes, the chapters are. Ben and I are the ones that invented the in-school. So now you get an in-school, just like you would basketball, mm-hmm. introduction, then you play club, right? Mm-hmm. Same type of thing. That is very exciting. And thank you for taking the time to share about the First Tee National School Program. It's amazing. Okay, mm-hmm. and then where did you go? We'll have to supersonic this story, but I was diagnosed with breast cancer while raising our children in 2000. And not in my family. I was an organic eater, long distance runner, and triathlete. So that was the last thing on my mind that was ever going to happen to me. But unfortunately, it's just immune system something, I think, I guess, why it happens. But anyways, I was diagnosed. I did a whole bunch of research, Natalie, and the best decision for me was to have a double mastectomy, which is removal of both breasts. I uh, went through this procedure. I was told to bring my husband's dress shirt. I'm not thinking. I'm just trying to survive. I woke up. She tried to get me dressed, and I got sick all over my husband's used dress shirt, and she said, the nurse said to me, I want everybody to hear this. Sometimes your crankiest, mean people are your best teachers. So I want you to hear Mm -hmm. this. Yes, I had a cranky nurse. She said, why did you bring this? And I said, well, excuse me, but first mastectomy, and why don't you provide something so I don't have to guess wrong? And then she said, well, women have always just suffered in silence. They just make do. And... My hair stood on end even more than it does, sadly. And I mean, I literally, I just couldn't even believe she said those words because I'm saying to myself, well, wait a minute, a sprained elbow gets a sling, right, Mm -hmm. to recover in without even asking. I've just been honestly altered for life, worried about survival. She pops these drain tubes in my hand, one in each hand puts me in a wheelchair and I said, what are these things? She said, oh, they're sewn into you. You've got to have them for two to three weeks. I said, ma'am, I need my hands. What am I supposed to do? And she said, well, don't worry. We'll give you some safety pins. You can pin them to your clothing. I am not walking through the door to my children to greet me with a throw up men's dress shirt and drains dripping and walk through the door and say, yeah, mommy's fine. I mean, it was so Mm -hmm. barbaric to me that I literally had an out-of-body experience in a wheelchair. And I'm like, if I can fix this, I will. Problem, I failed home ec. It's the only thing I've ever failed in my life. (laughs) I stapled my plateau pants (laughs) instead of hemming them because I had a basketball game and I was in a hurry and I did not understand the bottom bob or anything. I still don't really. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not kidding. And so then I'm like, how do I make a prototype when I can't even so or whatever I had in mind, I didn't even know at that time. And so I watched Coco Chanel three times to see that you could be a boss. I could invent an IBM. I could use a CAD system. I could, you know, do other things, but not when it came to fabric. Clothes. Uh-huh. That's out of my wheelhouse. So I made a prototype. My prototype 
I started, I said, I'm going to start this with a thousand dollars, not for financial reasons for me personally, I'm very blessed, but I want to do a thousand dollar startup because I want to be able to share my story. And if I can do it and I don't know how to sew and only Coco Chanel has taught me to be a boss of fabric, if I can do this and help 100 patients with a thousand dollars, I can share my experience to maybe college kids or anybody that wants to do an idea. So my thousand dollars to help a hundred patients happened. And I'm happy and proud to tell you that the hundred people has now turned into 20,000 souls Wow! with a thousand dollar startup. And I never cheated and tried to put in my own money to try to cover. I had to think and literally break my brain trying to figure out how to survive stay profitable i've heard this story before and i want to go back a little bit because there's some impressive stuff that you did here in this story and i remember you telling me about the fabric and how you found it and how you pitched i want to hear that part of it too because i feel like those are some interesting steps to listen to somebody else's journey. It might not necessarily happen like this, but yes, I do remember. Tell me a little bit more about how did you find your fabric and how did you even take it from, okay, this is what I'm going to do to now I'm helping 20,000 souls because there's a lot of, (laughs) there's a lot of you that you put in there and a lot of drive and passion behind all of that. And I don't want to miss that part either. Well, thank you. The uh, material was the biggest battle. You'd think it'd be so simple. It had probably 10, 20 modifications to try to get a shirt that is post-operative that looks like you're what I wanted, to look like you might be going to the gym or you might be battling cancer. So I wanted to look like you're going to the gym and not like a sickly patient. Mm-hmm. However, the skin is on fire after surgery. And i just be real honest, it almost feels like when your nerve endings are knitting back together, it feels like crawling. It's really, really uncomfortable. Emotionally, you know, we all put clothes on today and you want to feel kind of okay, right? You want to kind of be proud of, you know, what you chose to wear. I found it atrocious that there is no standardized, fair for all, post-op equipment for all this. So So let me interrupt you real quick. Sorry, because I remember you saying that when the nurse talked to you in the hospital, she said, well, why'd you bring this? I mean, I'm assuming, and I haven't been through it, but I'm assuming that they tell you to bring a button-down shirt, and that's probably why you picked your husband's shirt. Is that correct? Yeah, they actually told me to bring my husband's oversized Mm -hmm. button-down shirt. So they did that. When she tried to push my arm into one of the armholes when – the movement was too much. Oh, okay. And then, so that was it. But th- this is it now. Like, this is it. Listen, if a man was to lose his man parts <laughs> in the battle against cancer, I am convinced that not one doctor or nurse would tell this man to bring one of his wife's skirt to go in because it's non binding. Like, I do this as a keynote speaking engagement, and I, I do that, and the whole place erupts in laughter. And I said, I understand why you're laughing, because it seemed just ridiculous. But to it's ever true. Think of man to wear women's clothing because it's non-binding, and so hello, hang on one second. I have had my breasts removed from my body, and I was told to bring my husband's mm-hmm. used dress shirt. Mm-hmm. I just didn't put it all together until I didn't have breasts, and when I put it on, and I looked down, and there's nothing there, and I'm in my husband's dress shirt. It was enough to break the bank. I'm telling you, the emotional scarring, it's wrong. It's just wrong that we don't have standardized equipment. So I designed and patented it. And the crazy thing is, it's really hard to patent clothing. I mean, it is. And so I wrote my own patent because I'm bootstrapping it, which means that you're self-funded. You're not having to be... How does somebody write their own patent, though? So that's the thing that just blows my mind about you in particular is... Well, <laughs> you do true. everything. If, you're bootstrap, <laughs> if you do bootstrap, you have to bootstrap. You have to learn it all. I did right. a lot of research. Anyways, the really amazing blessing happened is the first patent I got, the USPTO called me and they said, is this Mrs. Matthews? Yes. And I'm thinking, ah, oh, they bombed my patent. And they said, well, ma'am, we're not only publishing you. I wish you could see this office. 
everybody is standing and clapping for you. Oh. Right and I'm like, wow, you know, wow, you know, God is a wind in my sails. I think I just moved, moved the ship a little bit with those wind in the sails. And I'm like, thank you. And they're like, no, thank you. I wish my aunt, my mom, my everybody had oh. one. I'm like, wow. I just having a still voice and a still mm-hmm. spirit to and, figure out how to help others. And so the shirt that you created, explain how it's different and so that people can learn about it. The shirt, why I fought so hard so long for this fabric is it had to feel like feathers. So the actual weight was the biggest battle. The actual material, it's actually hand done and especially coating for silk filling. Mm -hmm. And then I had to have, I felt very strongly about having Velcro opening in the front because self-dressing is so important to feel like you're still a person Mm -hmm. and not this patient that can't do anything. Because you can't even brush your own teeth after mastectomy surgery. You can't scratch your head. Your arms don't go past, like your reach is about your chin. Mm -hmm. And that's with your elbows pinned to the side of your body. So the shirt holds internally four deep pockets to hold up to four drains and Velcro opening, so all they have to do is slightly bend over and almost stand up, and it'll almost close itself. And I went through all kinds of iterations of this, snaps and magnets and blah. I mean, <laughs> when you're inventing, it's a deal, and Velcro is the best option. And so the material literally makes people get emotional when they put it on, and that's what I battled for a whole year for, so I'm super proud wow. on how soft, how soft this is. And I've so seen those shirts, think. and I agree. I mean, they are very soft. <laughs> Yeah, and so it helps for not only mastectomy surgery, because you have the medical drains to hold those medical drains. You have radiation, which can leave the skin bubbly, raw, and hurting, mm-hmm. and there's no, there's nothing on the market that's really super soft like this. And then the chemo for easy port access, and then reconstruction happens a year later. So, Natalie, this is the thing. You're going to love this. So I had to really crunch numbers, I'll be honest with you, mm-hmm. okay? I had to really crunch numbers to make this thing work. You have to. You have to know money and business and everything to survive. So you can do what? Help more people. So I just, I made it the same price as flowers. So I'd say same price as flowers, but helpful for a year. That's my Mm -hmm. little tagline. And why that's important is people don't know when people are having chemo or in the hospital after surgery, the flowers that they send. And I love flowers, but they have to stay on the nurse's desk. Oh, they bring really? them into the door and they show the patient that Mr. and Mrs. Smith sent the flowers and the patient looks and goes, oh, that's so nice. And that's the end. Okay, I was there. I understand how this works. And this is the reality. You can't have pollen and bacteria and things like that in rooms of people that are in immune system compromise or even mm-hmm. sometimes after certain surgeries. But anyways, again, I like flowers. I love flowers. But I thought, now this gift for the same price as flowers, will help somebody be a best friend and a blankie, if you will, for a whole year. (laughs) To be a socially responsible company, I used at the time Tom's shoes as a model. So that's a one for one. In business, the only way you can do one for one is if you have incredible profit margins. I wasn't in that category. So I really racked my brain on how can I give and how can I be the socially responsible company. Deep in my heart, I just said to myself, well, what if I work with nonprofits? And if I work with them, that's like Meals and Wheels, mashed potatoes and peas, and Mm -hmm. they have different vendors to get fulfilled their mission statement. And so the end goal was this. I work with these nonprofits, and as long as they are like an open and closed gate, that means the money comes in, and the money goes to the patients. None of this 10% goes to the mission statement and everything else is just administrative costs mm-hmm. and things like that. I won't have anything to do with any nonprofit that does not give at least 70% back to the cause. I do know that it does cost money to even run a nonprofit, so I'm not opposed to them having money. I want everybody to survive and be successful. But listen, by law, the only thing that is mandatory is 10%. That means 90% of every dollar can go off to different things and pay people. Well, 
I think they should be challenged a little bit more and be a little smarter and figure out how to actually fulfill their mission statement. So I work with some nonprofits, and this is the beauty. So we do hospital deliveries, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hospital delivery where the nurse navigators come down. We have a big party, lots of hugs. They run with boxes under their arm, and they freely, without any strings, no ask, provide a recovery kit to these patients from their community, and it's nothing but love. Wow. Yeah, for free, like no cost, there's no hooks, we don't even want their email. It's just good old school helping your neighbor build right. their barn. And so I'm really proud of that because that there's one in um, the Ultimate Healing Kit in Dallas, Texas, and then Gifting Care here in Austin. So we've been able to help thousands of patients at no cost to the patients, nothing but love and a hug and a well wishes for their journey. Wow. So that's how I'm socially responsible company, and I give to hardship cases, military, and things like that whenever I can from the LLC too. Wow. So. And we haven't even talked about the name of your company. So what is the name of your company? Thank you. It is HealInComfort.com. So HealInComfort.com. And why did I name it that? Well, it describes what it is that I did not experience. I did not heal in comfort. And so I figured my business and my give back will be to heal in comfort. And so I chose that name. Natalie, this is a little business hint. When you actually trademark a name and get it registered, it's actually very good to be very unique. Mm -hmm. There's no confusion. There's no, you're almost like, you know, this other company with a similar name, which can cause implications and problems. So any of your listeners out there that want to start a business, I'm all about trademarking a short sentence because it will not be competitive and it will not create confusion. There is nothing out there like healincomfort.com. And it's an LLC. I highly recommend your listeners if they're going to start a business to not be a DBA doing business as, but to organize a corporate structure called Limited Liability Corporation, LLC. It's one step removed, your business from your personal social security. Mm -hmm. So it's highly advantageous to do so. And, you know, it, it's funny. I'm going to stop. I want to pause because you've taught me so much just in the short phone calls that we have and just knowing you. And it's funny because I had this epiphany earlier this week when you and I had talked because I had helped somebody earlier. And then just the next day, we had a conversation. And it was funny because the person that I helped the night before said to me, how are you so business savvy? And here I am sitting, okay, I'm like not even business savvy at all. I'm trying to learn. And it's because I've put myself in this space and the people that I know, and they kind of give me hints and they give me, it's exactly what you just said. I'm sitting here thinking, I remember having conversations with multiple people talking about LLCs, DBAs, things that I didn't learn. I'm sure I don't even think you learned when you went to school, looking at all of your backgrounds. It is business. And to me, like I want to ask you now, because People had asked me, and I always say, it's the people I know. And, you know, I will name off people, including you and some of the others that we have in common that we know. But, and I probably know your answer because I just know who you are. <laughs> but how did you walk into this business world? Because you were engineering and a teacher and it's like business and, you know, getting your patent and, you know, everything. I mean, yes, it ended up being that one step led to the next step until the next step. And I know you and you probably just, just sat down and said, okay, let me figure this out. I mean, I know engineers and I know people that had the role of finding the answer and making sure that it replicated and what you did at IBM. And it's probably how you're hardwired. But how did you feel comfortable enough in making sure that you were doing the right thing in making your business decisions? Great question and two-word answer. Reverse engineer. Your listeners, they don't have to be engineered to reverse engineer. What your listeners can benefit from is to think backwards. I have a dream. I want to reach this goal. I have an invention, I have an, a system, I have a process or a service, and everybody starts off with, well, then I'll make my business cards. 
And then you go and you're like, whoa, I didn't know I had to have a blog and a website. You know, it's like go backwards and find out what I did is I reverse engineered why do 98% of entrepreneurs fail? Why? That was going to be my very first flag in the ground. Why do they fail? And I've come to the conclusion, this is just me personally, is it's fear and it's debt. So people don't understand money in the business of money, the energy of money and the flow of money. So they kind of bump along at midstream. They're like, I'm out of money. Oh, it's money's just the shells for sharing and trading. So money is some entity you need to know about. So I reverse engineered, why do all these entrepreneurs fail? And it was always because they get into debt because they built in correctly. Mm-hmm. Then they get into fear. So all their creativity stops. And all they are then is on a hamster wheel trying to pay the bills pay their creditors and debtors and VCs and everybody. And they're not having fun. They're not being creative. They're not being innovative. They're just pushing to try to get those bills paid. Wow. They finally just give up and you're out of energy. It's too hard. But if you build opposite, right, Mm -hmm. find out where the big sinkholes are in business. And then I have role models like Sharon Lecter. How did that woman do all that she has done? And how can I fast track and learn sound bites? Because you just cannot absorb enough information, right? Mm -hmm. I listen to podcasts and do these type of things. But I'm going to just tell you, reverse engineer, how will you fail? And, you know, I do a lot of keynoting, speaking, and actually even flown to London for the undefeated convention It was amazing and wonderful, and my topic was the inventor in you. So my big message while I'm going through this is not just look at my story. It is meant to be an inspiration for you and your listeners to find the inventor in them. Do they have to be an IBM? and do? No way. I know that every single person listening has come up with an excellent solution, a better idea, right? Right. A better redesign. And what they do is they might at the most tell a friend at the most. And so when I speak, I ask them, raise your hand if you've ever had a good idea. I get 100% if you ever told a friend, "Eh, I'm still up there. Okay. And then raise your hand if you've written it down. Keep your hand up if you've made a prototype. That means it doesn't matter if it's out of toilet paper rolls, Kleenex boxes, yarn, clothespins, did you make a prototype? Did you put your hands on your idea? And then like, oh, I think I have about 20% left. Keep your hands up if you filed. And in less than 2% of all women have ever been inventors and filed. Wow. Isn't that terrible? Wow. Because I think women and men, but women think on their feet when they're raising children. They're like, oh, I wish these wheels were bigger. Right. The stroller and stuff getting stuck in the rocks. Why did a man bring that out? Because they just have the confidence to say, I can fix that. I'm surprised when you said 20% actually made a prototype. I was thinking a lot less we're going to drop. Because I feel like, yes, everybody has these ideas, but you're right. Fear takes over and they won't even make the step. It's like you talk yourself out of it. So I'm I'm really surprised. 20% was the audience that we had. We had people that were interested in hearing the adventure you. So that's why the probably higher higher number of people. And and often they would come afterwards and not actually really know what a prototype was. So for your listeners, a prototype is something physical that you can touch, something that you can modify, might have moving parts or not. A drawing or schematic is different than, you know, the prototype. So you have to physically build. And again, you can use scotch tape. I do it all the time. So I have the fun story that in London, I told everybody, I put up this slide. I said, this is a pencil. And everybody's like, yeah. I said, guess what? There's so many billionaires running around this planet that has modified a pencil and sold it. And everybody's like, hmm, what? So I did the next slide and it was pencils with eyeballs on them and, and hair mm-hmm. and some pencils were bendy and some pencils are like gummy thing and some pencils did this and that and then they all erupted in cheer they're like of course i've seen these things on the market i don't even think that that's somebody's invention a modification of something that already sells a pencil 
So how can you make a pencil even more engaging and interesting and sell? Mm-hmm. That's all I did. A simple thought. Why can't all children learn golf? Why right. can't women heal in comfort and dignity after being basically mutilated? Right. Because <laughs> that feels that way. I give them all a pencil, and I let them go into like little groups. I said, do something, and then sell it to me. With a oh, pencil. I love that. How much fun is that, Natalie? <laughs> oh, my gosh. I would love that. <laughs> I know. It was a great exercise because they first look at you like, uh-uh, it's already been done. There's nothing more right. you can do to the pencil. And you just showed me how people made money off a pencil. Right. We're done. And then they would start, well, what if? See? Because if you can open the mind of your thinking process that even a pencil isn't done, then the whole world will open up to you. I don't even look at door handles the same way. As oh, my do. gosh. Oh, my gosh. You're going to make me do this all day long. <laughs> yeah. No, it's absolutely the best playground in the world. Everybody thinks they need to be Ben Franklin and the guy with the kite. Forget about it. Right. It's called open your mind to innovative thinking in everything you do and have fun. And it's actually a very creative, fun, free thinking space. Yeah. Okay. So these people came up with really cool ideas. And one of the best ideas, honestly, came from a 16-year-old that a parent brought to the convention. Uh And I asked her to stand up and share. And she said, well, we still use pencils. And what do 90% of the children do with pencils? And I was like, I don't know. She led us up like perfect for the big sham wow. You know, and she goes, we put them in our mouths. And everybody bites the little seal thing where the rubber is. So why don't we have pop on lollipop? Oh, my gosh. I was going to say flavor. I was wondering where you were going to go with that. Oh, my gosh. That you could pop in there. So when you're thinking, you're stimulating the brain. That's why people put pencils in their mouth, by the way. Oh, my gosh. It's because uh, when you're stuck in your thinking without touching, the kinesthetic touching that opens up different wow. pathways in the brain. That's why people usually tap their knee or their foot starts right. shaking when they're trying to figure the word, they're trying to figure out a word or trying to be creative. So people put their pencils in their mouth when they're thinking. They don't do it when they know the answer. They're not like putting their mouth in the answer while writing, you know, the answer to quantum physics. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. they're not doing that. They're busy writing it out, right? Right. So when they don't know, what do they do? They tap it. Or they put it in their mouth. And this child stood up and I said, oh, my goodness. And everybody erupted in cheer. What did that do for that little girl that's never thought of herself as an inventor? Oh, wow. See? And I'm hoping we can give to your listeners the same excitement. The spark, yeah. Of that they do have an inventor in them. Yeah. Wow. And uh, so this is a funny demonstration at the end. I said, well, I'd like to share with you my idea. Okay, and I held up the pencil, Natalie, and I pushed the top of the pencil, and I said, because this is when it first came out, you know, like nobody really knew about it. I'd say, Alexa, what is the equation for Einstein's theory of relativity? And of course, this big booming speaker behind me said, the equation for Einstein's theory of relativity is equals mc squared, and everybody freaked out. Because they thought my pencil was talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, so why can't the pencil help the children do their homework? Oh, my right? God. Yeah, my kids would love it. But, I mean, it was just to exercise creative thinking and fun. That's right, all. right. Wow. Yeah. And everybody just loved it. So it was really great. And why I wanted to share that is because one that makes me get so excited when I see these huge, massive smiles and people standing up, interrupting other people because of their idea Mm -hmm. about a pencil. I actually had to have control and put my hands like, okay, everybody sit down, sit down. It was so engaged. That is so funny. From just looking at you going, yeah, that's a pencil, great. To, that that's exactly right now. Yeah, that's right. You're right on. It's. I mean, you just fired up everybody to think and look at the world in a different way, which is incredible. And I believe it. I want to get back to the heart and the why, because what you didn't talk about yet is you've invented an amazing product through your experiences and a business and inspiration for others and your keynote speaker. You also work in your business 
as well. I mean, I've known where you've had to take calls, you've had to be at hospitals, you've had to hold hands, you've had to, and it's the same thing with the First T National School Program too. You talked about it and I could feel your heart coming through the phone because of that too. So there is that tug as well, which I find incredible about you because I think of you as, okay, well, she was this engineer and people tend to group people into these categories of, okay, well, then you're only this sort of brain, right? Left brain, right brain, whatever. Or maybe you can't do emotions as well. But I feel like you're doing everything and you're grasping at all the skills and the passion and the drive that you have in all these different areas that make you who you are. And it all comes together. But there's also even things that you're looking to in the future. And you and I have talked about having multiple forms of income coming in or having multiple things going on at the same time. And I love that because sometimes I feel out of place because I'm not just this audiologist and this is where I went to school and this is what I'm supposed to be doing. But I do have things in different areas, just like you. But you have some things that I also want you to talk about. Like, where do you see this going and what you feel like you're doing in five years from now, in 10 years? I mean, because there is still somewhat where you've got to be able to see out in the future. And I know you have, you advise people, you know, in businesses and you're an angel investor and you have all of these different outlets for you to continue to bring who you are to other people. How are you taking now what you are doing in all areas of your life here that you just talked about and paying it forward that way as well? Well, that's a lot of questions. I'm (laughs) going to try to, uh, (laughs) I love them all. I'm just going to try to uh, be strategic here and try to see what is most helpful to your listeners. Yes, you need seven to eight independent spokes of revenue coming in, whether assets are generating income, mailbox money, fall in love with mailbox money, everybody fall in love with mailbox money, figure it out. It's not that hard. And Sherry just uh, taught me about that. And I was blown away and it's probably very easy. And actually it is. She taught me about it. And um, yes, so I agree. There's, there's different things that I swear your brain just picks up and you just pass out this information. It's crazy. (laughs) It is crazy. Okay, go on. But can I paint the picture of the wagon wheel for people? If you want to, yeah. I wasn't too sure if you wanted to share that or not. But yes, absolutely, because I I love that. Really really quick with it. Yeah, and it's my IP. I'll tell you what it is. I need everybody that's listening to draw a little circle in the middle of a piece of paper. I'm doing it again right now. Hitting each (laughs) side of the paper. So now you have kind of a little circle and a big circle and draw the one spoke from 12 o'clock to six o'clock. So you have one spoke in the middle, just from top to middle. The middle is your hub. It's called a hub. And let's say you have a goal in life or you have a goal in your business. And for me, let's say it's 50,000 patients. Okay. How am I going to get there? Most people concentrate on their one spoke. They stay in their lane. They do their thing. I ask you this. If that wagon wheel with one spoke was to go down what I call the bumpy road of entrepreneurship or business, how long will it survive when it hits a bump? It will crack that spoke so fast that wouldn't be funny. And guess what? It's over. Game over. Yep. What if you put two? Eh, a little bit better. So the actual answer to get to your hub, to get to your vision, is to build seven to eight spokes. So if one breaks, it's not game over. If two breaks, still not game over. See, and that's your safety net. And if you use this for your finances, if you use this for personal goals, it is a snapshot. Every day you can look at your wagon wheel and say, I am concentrating way too hard on one spoke. So if that breaks, it's over, game over. And I'm going to be disheartened in my efforts. So that's the wagon wheel in brief. No, I love it. um, It's such a good reminder and new, hopefully, for the listeners because it's so easy to look at it that way once you've explained it. And I hope people can understand that too. And this is why I have dear friends like Sherry who I can call upon because it's incredible. Look, it took you a few seconds to explain that, but it made total sense. And it's such a great reminder. So thank you for sharing what you've created here too. With the, yeah, with the you're wagon welcome. wheel. And 
the passion, the, I believe the next part of your question was the, the passion and the drive. Okay, it's pretty simple for me. I'm a God girl. I'm not, I'm going to say, and I say it all the time, I'm not a boring God girl, which means um, not to criticize boring God girls, but I do not. I ride motorcycles <laughs> around Coda Formula One's track at 130 <laughs> miles per hour. I jump off of cliffs. I jump out of helicopters. Okay, who does not want to meet Sherry Matthews now, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, we ride motorcycles all over the world. We just rode, when I spoke in London, we went over to Scotland, ran all through Scotland. We just, six months ago, just got back from Europe. We rode motorcycles through Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Italy, and back in, all on the Alps. The biggest challenging riding I've ever done in my life. So I am a God girl, but I have a lot of fun, and I'm not normal. I like <laughs> quantum physics. I like things about the God particle that some of you may understand what that means because they still don't understand how the atom actually exists. So what drives me is this. I believe energy never dies. Einstein even proved that. When our physical body, which I call the earth suit, when it fails, we go on. Energy keeps going, okay? And I believe that I will stand before the creator and I hear, I want to hear only one thing. Well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. I have been blessed to be born, to survive two heart surgeries and cancer. And my drive is to leave the campsite cleaner than when I came. And it is not birth out of fear of, oh, I'll get a penalty if I don't, which some religions teach wrong. I believe literally every single cell in my body, even talking like this, to actually get that trophy, well done, good and faithful mm -hmm. servant. My life had a purpose. I left the campsite cleaner. I did all that I can to help humanity and animals and the earth. I'm a tree hugger. I want to be happy with my journey. I don't want to just survive. I don't want to have lost dreams. I don't want to have unfulfilled what ifs. I want to have as little and few regrets as possible. Natalie. So that's what gives me the drive. And it's really fun. It's a lovely, wonderful, exciting day every single day for me. It's like, okay, what are we going to do? How are we going to help? I'm open. open I am going to replay this listen. every day. You just made my day. <laughs> Aww. Well, it is it's, so it's inspirational. Fun. It's, and it's you it's speaking from the too. heart. Yeah, exactly. And it's just you living your life. It's not because you're trying to be inspirational. It's just because you've lived it. You have this mindset and it's something that you want to share with others so that if it's something that they can walk into, they can walk into. You know, it's not saying that everybody has to be exactly like you because there is absolutely no way. Oh, no. But to no. find <laughs> what it is that you should be doing um, and it's not only that, but it's your drive. I mean, it really is, you have an idea, run with it. Find a way, figure it out. Reach out to people if too. Yeah, yep. if it's singing to your soul. So the real bottom line question is, why else are we here? Yep. To bring in a little deeper, why else are you here, regardless of where, where you stand in your faith and all, you know, whatever. I'm just sharing my story, but really you have to ask yourself, why, why, why else are you here? If it's not to leave the campsite cleaner, to help humanity, to help little animals that need help, and they're too helpless to help themselves, to not make the earth a better place, cleaner, more for the next generation. Why else are you here? So if you're not fulfilling that every day, then you're putting in the time on the hamster wheel. And it's not about so that. That's no. the, yeah, that's the fun part for me is like, okay, let's go see what's happening today. I have one last question I want to ask you because I do want people, okay. if they have connected to you or to any, anything or any organization or what you're doing, and you can choose if you want to talk about both or whatever you need, I want to put it out there and ask you for an ask. What kind of help or connections, what is your ask for people to do to either help you or to help them spark their, uh, let's do that, because you focus a lot on really trying to inspire, you know, the inventor and, and for people to, to take maybe their idea to the next level. What is it? What, what would be your ask if you had one or two or three? Well, <laughs> so, yeah, no, 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 that's a great question. I thank you very, very much. 
I think the big ask is to join in with the vision I have is one day, possibly, the Heal and Comfort patented product will be a standard, as standard as a sling for a sprained elbow. Mm -hmm. I've already done all the hard work. My proof of concept is 20,000 sold. It's like trying to steer the Titanic, everybody out there. There are processes and it's so deep that it's, I can't mm -hmm. control. I can't even move. I can't even nudge. So, you know, helping me get the word out and simply following even on Twitter, which is just at Heal in Comfort, at Heal in Comfort, is a help. Okay. Help get the word out. Be like little business evangelists. You know, I've heard this story, and even if you don't even need, and hopefully nobody does ever need my product. Mm -hmm. and unfortunately, a quarter of a million people just in America do. So help me get the word out. Yeah, I was just going to ask you that question because you've got 20,000 souls that you talked about. How many actually would need your product? There's uh, 250,000 people every year just in America diagnosed with breast cancer. Wow. So all I'm asking for followers would be like, follow me on some social yeah. media. If, you, if there's something that resonates with you, give it a retweet because it's really going to be the army of one. The people's voices are so powerful. That's how we reach the schools. And you don't have to be they a just, nurse. You don't have to be no. in the hospital to try to get in there or anything like that. But all you're saying is follow you on social media, which I will have all of your social media handle names and contact information in our show notes. Tweet something out that you like. Yeah, and it, that would be a, a really massive help. And if they need help or somebody knows somebody has been diagnosed, go on on over to healincomfort.com and buy something the same price as flowers. You know the story behind it now, yep. but it's helpful for a year. You'll just bless that person yep. so much. And I've done that I mean, too. And I've sent those as gifts to people that I've known. And honestly, too, I want to say on your website, you even have other t-shirts for supporters as well. So it's not just the only Heal in Comfort shirt, but you have other products and different things that people can purchase to help support your cause that actually support a loved one in your life going through That's right. and then, surgery. Yeah, and this crazy little pouch, I have a two-pocket pouch that I actually had to design, believe it or not, with a tech pack. That's like, you know, those are like $1,000 for a two-pocket pouch. Anyway, wow. that's trending on Amazon. The shirt, Heal and Comfort, and the two-pocket pouch are trending on Amazon. And just that two-pocket pouch, it's because I couldn't find it out there. We're selling three to 500 a month just on Amazon. People are wow. putting their drains, their cell phones. Their... The worst thing is to be a, a patient in one room like your bedroom, and you finally get out to watch a little TV and feel like a person, and you forgot your pills, or you forgot your cell phone, and to shuffle back is a big deal. I mean, you get pretty tired. Yeah. So the idea with the extra set of hands, helping hands, was this little pocket thing, and I'm going to tell you, it's trending that wow. way again. It's, it's crazy for you me, are... but I have one more question, if I may. Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, for you. So we are speaking on this amazing podcast. What is in your heart on why you're doing what you're doing? I'm so thankful to be a guest that I want to know what's driving you to take this time right now to share with your listeners what's driving you. Honestly, and thank you for asking. I feel like I have had the privilege, and I'm going to get shaky because it's true, but I've had the privilege to meet some of the most incredible people and you know, people have looked at my life on social media or whatever it may be. And it's like you said, everybody sees the good things, right? And it's just the connections I've made, the opportunities. And I feel like it's almost not fair. I mean, I get access to all these amazing people who can direct me and guide me and teach me. And I turn around and might be able to do that for somebody else. But really, I attribute where I am today from some of these connections that I've made. And Honestly, the reason why I started this podcast was in order to introduce some of these amazing people and what they're doing to the world. And especially with 
where social media is going and a lot of people get frustrated with social media and I agree there's sometimes where you know sometimes you just have to walk away I still love it I love the technology that we have at our fingertips I love staying connected with people but I have noticed that it also creates the negative side of people such as anxiety and I'm not good enough and it goes down that road and so I want a chance to be able to turn it around and use technology and use connections to show that there are still good people out there doing good, creating something good, and pushing it out for other people to come along behind and do the same. And so that's the reason why I'm doing this. Wow. <laughs> that is absolutely beautiful. I, I'm even more honored to be on oh. this podcast with you, Natalie. I mean, this is, boy, doesn't the world need to hear this. I mean, there are so many great people with positive yes. things yes. to share. And sometimes even the things, you know, you fall down and you bump your knee because you're learning. Mm-hmm. It's good to share, to let exactly. people know, oh, it's not easy. You don't clap your hands and all of a sudden you reach 20,000. You know, it's so good to be authentic mm-hmm. and to truly share from the heart. And to share good. Yep. And that's really who you are, Natalie. You are a teacher. See? An influencer and a teacher. One who brings inspiration and light. That's who you are. Thank you. A special person who has a calling in their soul to help others. And we're using technology so you can reach more than you can have in your kitchen. Yep, absolutely. Yep. There you go, girl. Wow. I love that. (laughs) Well, thank you so much. Again, you're just one of my treasured friends that I have been so blessed and lucky to have met and who will continue to be in my life. It's just incredible watching your journey. Thanks, Natalie. And thank you again for this great honor. And everybody out there listening, you are an inventor. You are an innovator. Get it out of your head. Get it on paper. And go get some toilet paper rolls and start making it. (laughs) (laughs) Just get it going. Just get it going. So thank you for this great time. Thank you. 